Hi, welcome to the bathtub. It's the old masturbator. We've been having a big battle with with Dodo up here. Uh, well, I did the Tom dish, and I'm going to do this one. But she's settled down now, so I don't need to bring out the hat, but I will if I have to. We're going to talk briefly again today. I'm, I've been falling behind on these because I get I start reading all these different things in different places. I've been working on some long essays, and so I've been I I only take into the bathtub stuff I don't have to write about or I try to do that. So I've been filling in the my bathtub time with some really odd little books like Tom Dish's wonderful Troll of Sherwood Forest. And I also this week, uh, well, about a couple of weeks ago by now, reread a book that I, I enjoyed as a kid, which is A.E. Van Vogt's Slan. Is that a cool cover? I mean, come on. This is the old Berkeley paperbacks. They were, they were gorgeous. And uh, I had read this. This is one of the first science fiction books I read. I must have been 13 or 14 or 15. Uh, I read, discovered Ray Bradbury, and then that kind of led me into reading other science fiction. And I'm not saying I was, he, I was not a huge A.E. Van Vogt fan, but he was something absorbing about him, and there's still something that just doesn't hit the palate except A.E. Van Vogt. You, there's just times when you just want to read A.E. Van Vogt, and there's no one else who fits that bill. Um, say a few words about him. One thing is I'm going to title this, you know, if you love Philip K. Dick, you might well like Van Vogt. He's not the sort of, he's not well as well known at all as Philip K. Dick is now. He doesn't have that sense of kind of the lower middle class blues of the Philip K. Dick characters who work in these horrible, crummy jobs in usually somewhere in the middle of California, somewhere, you know, like tire regrooving factories or, or selling uh, chrome lampshades and stuff like that. <laughs> they always have horrible jobs in Philip K. Dick. But Philip K. Dick was really, uh, he, he was a big fan of Van Vogt, and he often, and he read him a lot when he was growing up. Like a lot of the science fiction writers in the 60s and 70s were very influenced by Van Vogt. His stuff is, was published in Astounding, we we talked about we've been doing a little series called uh, in the footsteps of astounding which which is connected to the uh, the Navala Lee book about John Campbell and and A. Van Vogt was one of the top writers one of the most popular writers at astounding my favorite uh, uh, what is it uh, aspect of the old astounding magazines the John W Campbell stable was they all pretended like they were writing science fiction and there was really a authentic science was used to figure these wacky books out and the books are completely insane there's nothing scientific about an a van book novel i swear to god he just makes stuff up and he just pulls these ideas out of his ass and he calls it science and then he just goes on to the next idea many of you may know that uh, he had a method for writing which he he, he talks about it in, a, in several interviews where he would write 800 words go to sleep and set the alarm clock to wake him up at like 2.30 in the morning. And then he would take whatever happened in his dreams and incorporate it into the next 800 words, something like that. There's a sur surreal disjunction between the narrative scenes in an in a, in a A. E. Van Vogt novel. And many people say, I've never read a lot of the late novels, but I did really like the World of Nolle and, P and Pawns. Of, I read two of the Nolle books. And we've talked about one of them on here. His short stories are probably his best story, his best fiction, because they don't get too over the top. His novels tend to just go veering all over the place. The Weapon Shops of Isher is one of his most famous books, which I haven't, I never liked as much. I don't have to say it. I do, did like Slan. Slan is, is is definitely worth reading. He's a, it, he, he sets his books in these kind of super far future worlds where all sorts of things have happened that uh, are kind of hard to believe. And uh, it's there's a sense of unreality and and kind of almost hyper reality at the same time. I, I don't know if I, that describes it well. Slan, what a slan is, many people at the time when the book came out, and, oh, I, should, I wish you know this stuff. It's it's copyright 1940, 1945, 1951. A lot of these uh, vote van vote stuff was published originally as serials or long stories and an astounding and unknown, and then he later. Put, patched them together into books, and Slan was one of his most popular ones. The premise of Slan is that there's a there's a kind of super race. He's very interested in super races, and as you may know, he gets involved quite deeply involved with L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics crowd, and and, and is actually I think he's an auditor at, for 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 the Scientology, the Church, I guess they would call it. Anyway, he, he he starts off. He's always interested in, in the notion of these kind of super creatures and these super super uh, supermen and super women who hide out in our society. Um, it's kind of a common theme in a lot of SF. You can think of 
Theodore Sturgeon's uh, More Than Human has a similar I idea in it. But in this one, the slan are these people who have who they can read minds. They can read minds. They're, they're super intelligent, so they can they're they're way ahead of the normal human beings. They have tendrils that go through their head. They're kind of easy to find because they have these like these like tendrils that go through their hair, and that's why they have to wear hats a lot. And at the beginning of the book, there's a guy named Jami Cross. There's two slan. One is named Jami Jami Cross, Jami, and then there's a girl whose name I just forgot. And uh, Jami's mother gets killed at the beginning because there's been a war between these super, super techno telepaths and the normal human beings who hate them and who are afraid of them. And this is, takes place many, many years after this war has gone on. And the slant have all disappeared. And Jami's like the last of the slant that he knows of. And his mother and his father and both his parents die when he's very young. And he has to find his own life and he ends up living with some crazy old woman, which is a very interesting kind of a crazy character. And then there's another woman, a young girl about his age. She's a slam, and she lives with the president of the world. I forget his name now, too, but he's like some... He's supposed to be some anti slan but that changes all sorts of... He's, he's, he's keeping her in the house because he wants to, under, to study the slan. That's what he says, and you find out all sorts of things. Anyway, I don't want to give away too much because the book does really make these incredibly weird swerves, like a Philip K. Dick novel. Though the Philip K., even Philip K. Dick tends to have a little bit more structure to his books, a little bit, and he's not a highly structured novelist. But Van Vogt's stuff tends to veer quite wildly from one side to another. So Johnny grows up and he's, he, gets, he inherits this super weapon from his dad, whose dad has designed a super weapon, which basically it looks like one of those metal, those metal pointers you use in like, te you know, you're teaching in school, the, the, the collapsible, it's like a, it's a metal rod that can kind of like destroy planets and spaceships and so forth. And then he, I figured he steals a spaceship, I don't know, he gets a spaceship anyway, and he can, he can tunnel through the earth and hide under planet, and he can go off in the, in, the, in the space. And I won't tell it more than that, but it's about the conflict of this young kid and this girl trying to find their way in this world that hates them, and hates who Slan are. Supposedly, a lot of early science fiction fans in the 40s and 50s used to call themselves Slan, I guess. That's what I, that's what I seem to have heard that from somewhere. Um, but it's a great, it's a kick. It's, Van Vogt, if you're in the right mood, is a total kick. And it's definitely a bathtub read because it's, it, it's completely absurd sometimes, some of the ideas. Very surreal and yet has a believability to it that you get from kind of a good science fiction novel. You really are wrapped up in this kind of futuristic world. Anyway, I wanted to give you a quick passage. This is the kind of stuff that Van Vogt throws around as science. And you basically have to have a bit of a sense of humor and not take it too seriously because he says this stuff. And when people tell me they really wish they, they had that good old hard science fiction where they really, really knew science, I think of Van Vogt because I don't know. He just makes this stuff up. Anyway, he's, he's flying around. He's going to Mars on this spaceship. And he's avoiding all these media, all these, these mines that the... I don't know, the planetary somebody. There's, there's, there's a different tribe of slans running around who don't have the tendrils. And um, Anyway, he's going to Mars, and he says, uh, as he's traveling, here's a little explanation of why, how he can avoid the, land, the space mines. Completely invisible, traveling at many miles per second, his, hip, his ship headed for Mars. He must have hurtled through minefields, but that didn't matter now. The devouring disintegration rays that poured out from the walls of his great machine ate up mines before they could explode and simultaneously destroyed every light wave that would have revealed his craft to alert eyes out there in the blaze of the sun. He's destroying light waves. I don't know why that has to happen. There was only one difference. The mines were smashed before they reached his ship. Light, be, here's the scientific explanation, being in a wave state as it flashed up, could be destroyed only during that fraction of instant when it touched his ship and started to bounce. I don't know what percent, what fractional infinitesimal period of time it is between light hitting a ship and bouncing off it. Um, at the very moment of bouncing, its speed reduced. The corpuscles that basically composed it lengthened according to the laws of the Lawrence Fitzgerald contraction theory. At that instant of almost quiescence, the fury of the sun's rays was blotted out by the disintegrators. There's often passages like that in Van Vogt, which, which are not the best part of his books. His books are just fun for the 
weird and kind of wild uh, uh, s swerving narrative ideas he comes up with. Um, but uh, the science is, is like that. Okay, uh, have, a, have a great uh, bath with somebody you love, with a writer you love, and sometimes the writer I love is definitely A.E. Van Vogt, uh, one of Philip K. Dick's favorite science fiction writers. Happy bathing.